video. Not surprising. You're watching a video right now. Video is wildly effective and you should be thinking in regards to all of the aspects. Should this be on video instead of written content? Um, it's said that is what 53 times more likely to get ranked on the first page of Google or the top list of Google if your website has video on it. And I know you've collected some additional amazing statistics on video. According to Marketing Sherpa, videos attract three times the traffic of other types of content and they help nurture leads, including a video on your landing page can boost your conversion rate by up to 80%. We see that all the time. Yes, video on every landing page. 65% of executives have gone to the marketer's site and 39% have called them on the phone after watching marketing videos. We add a lot of videos to our sales enablement as follow-up. I love being able to do that high quality support. Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Marketing Blender Show. I am Dacia Coffey. And I'm Daisy McCarty. Now today, this is almost kind of a part two, but don't worry if you haven't seen part one, no big deal. But today we are talking about what should be in your B2B content marketing funnel. Now the reason I say that it's kind of a part two is that we did a deep dive on B2B marketing funnels recently, and we've actually gotten a lot of interesting and really healthy feedback from that. And so I love that we're doing a second part to this. And this one is gonna be a lot more tactical. We just want to give you ideation around maybe new things that you can try in your content marketing because everyone is researching. Research shows that buyers, B2B buyers, are as much as 85% of the way through their selling process before they ever talk to a live human being. So content marketing is critical because how I look at this is it's setting the table for, did you even get a seat at the table? Like either the deck is set in your favor, stacked in your favor, or it's not. That's true. And I used to work in purchasing, as you know, and I can tell you when I was doing online research, if you weren't in the first two pages of results, if I was doing a really deep dive on finding vendors, there was no way that you were going to ever put in an RFP on anything that we were buying just because you don't have unlimited time to look at every single thing. Yeah. So content marketing is extremely important. One of the things that I was uh, looking at recently was a recommendation from the book Oversubscribed. And I think it has a lot of validity for B2B buyers because although everybody has less time than ever before, B2B buyers do tend to be more deliberate and intentional and they really need to have built trust before they make a yes decision because the decisions they make impact a lot of people and impact their career. Absolutely. And the 7411 rule was one that I really enjoyed. And the it stands for seven hours of binge worthy content. Now for a lot of B2B companies, that's like, I don't think we have like an hour of stuff that people could read or would want to read. So number two is across four platforms. And that doesn't mean four social media platforms. That means four platforms Total. So that could be a YouTube channel. It could be email. It could be LinkedIn. It could be your website. website. So just yeah. four, four platforms and then 11 touches. So touch them 11 times. Again, it could be tagging them in a social media post. It could be sending them an email. It could be a direct mail campaign. But those 11 touches, that tends to be about the amount of investment that people need to feel was made in connecting with them and communicating with them and educating them before they build that trust factor to make a next step. Agreed. And the 11 touches is really not surprising because you and I talk a lot about the research that shows it takes basically seven to 13 touches to get a lead. And so that consistency is really important. And, you know, one of the other things about content is it needs to have a role and a goal. So before I dive into the different types of roles and goals we want to assign, when you're thinking about the buyer's progress, I think about, okay, in the very beginning, that we need to be able to get through that war on attention. And so do they have the capability and even the bandwidth to receive that information? Like what environment is that first touch coming in? And that's why that consistency is so incredibly important because maybe they were busy. Maybe they wanted to read that and they couldn't. Maybe they got through it and they got just, you know, disrupted. And so that consistency in getting through those touches is critical. And later, as you go through the content marketing journey with the buyer's journey, 
you want that content building confidence in the buyer so they don't bail or they don't get overwhelmed, but it creates progress and momentum for them to cross the finish line that they want it to because buying in B2B is a progress milestone because it's them saying, we're getting a resource, getting support, getting consulting, making strides towards something that we have to accomplish in our business or something we have to source in order to keep going. So I always like to remember, roll in a goal in regards to content, that there is a specific experience that that buyer is having when they receive those touches, which is why you've got to go the distance. Yes. And when you're thinking about the role and the goal of your content, it's the role and the goal in the buyer's mind. So not necessarily, what do I want to make this thing do? Or how do I want to use this content to make somebody else do the thing I want them to do? But from the buyer's perspective, what purpose is that content serving for them? Because it's not serving a purpose, then it doesn't belong in your marketing funnel. Exactly. Now, when it comes to B2B content, I want you to think about three roles and goals. Number one, role and goal is awareness content. In this scenario, you're just asking people to pay attention just a couple seconds. And there are two different types of awareness content, awareness about their problem, and then awareness that you have the capability to solve their problem. But again, only a couple seconds in this type of content. Now, in the second role and goal content, this is trust. You're building trust in the buyer's mind that you can help them. And that is asking them to spend time with you. And in the third type of B2B content, then you're thinking about closing content. What are the components that help give a buyer confidence to move across that finish line and to actually make that purchase? I'd say there's one more piece of that funnel and that's referral content. You love it. Yes. So the final piece in your marketing funnel goes beyond that initial sale and helps you sell through word of mouth and referral by continuing to deliver consistent value in your marketing funnel, that's the thing that makes you shareable and that makes people want to spread your content to others that they know have the same problem. Love that one. Now, we are not going to organize this based on this because we're going to go ahead and go into the different types of content. And so I promised ideation, so we're going to go ahead and do that. But I want to point out that all of these different types of content can be applied to each different type of role and goal. And so just thinking about how do you best serve the buyer? So because we talked about role and goal, I'm going to start with advertising campaigns as a type of content. Now, typically advertising campaigns are in the awareness stage. They can morph around, but these are attention grabbers. They're interesting. They pique curiosity or they validate something the buyer is already thinking. And for me, I really want people thinking about the emotion behind a problem or the emotion behind a goal, because that emotion typically is the thing that really cuts through the clutter. For sure. I'd say that short form content is probably the next one. And I know IBM still does 40 page white papers, but none of our clients are IBM. No. And most of them don't want to read white papers. Now, there are other kinds of long form content that we'll touch on later that they do want to read. But for the most part, people want things in as small bite-sized pieces as they can possibly get it. So for example, when I do case study revisions for my clients, we literally strip out all of the elaborate narrative storytelling and we show this was before, this was after with metrics and this is how the client felt about the process of getting there. Yes. And it's literally a scannable page with the things that today's B2B buyers care about. And all the rest of it, sorry, but that's gone. Now we do have some B2B buyers who want to read the story and knowing which kind of buyer persona you're talking to is very important. I've got clients that have community bank and credit union customers and they want the story. Yeah. And I've got clients who have ops manufacturing leader personas. They don't care. They want the bullet points. They want the bullet points. That's yep. all they want. So making sure that you're really getting that, uh, that content as small as possible. And obviously video, 30 second clips, 60 seconds, that's incredibly high value. So high value. Now, one of the things I loved was you're talking about bite size, which for me then automatically leads to the next type of content, which is visual content. Use visual content in your B2B content marketing. Show, don't tell. And there have been times where we have literally taken seven and eight page case studies and turned them into a single infographic on a single page for hardcore engineering content. It is possible. 
take the time and seeing is believing. What the eyes perceive automatically creates higher influence and higher believability. And sometimes this can be as simple as a photo with maybe a markup where you're pointing arrows at something or circling something appropriate, or it can be something as elaborate as an illustration or an infographic. But I love visual content because it just has so much legs when it comes to converting interest into inquiry and belief. I find that this is one of the top areas for sales enablement. Yeah. Almost every client that I've worked with over the last year has been like, I need a way to communicate this incredibly concept, uh, complicated concept. Can we do it visually? <laughs> and the answer is usually yes. And it's usually the thing that makes it so much easier to sell. I would say the next piece for the kinds of content that should be in a marketing funnel is two-way content. So polls are great because number one, you get the engagement on the initial poll where people are speaking their opinion and people love to give their opinions. But then you have you know, all the data that came from that poll that you can then reshare as a piece of content. I'm a bit, also a big believer in crowdsourcing content that goes in your funnel because guess what? Your buyers are going to be looking at what's happening around you and what people are saying about you. So why not get involved in that? Because that's actually part of the content marketing funnel that you may not be aware of or that you may not be stewarding yet. So make sure that when you're thinking about your content funnel, look at the areas where you can crowdsource that and the areas where you can get involved with the conversations that are happening about your brand outside of the platforms that you control. I love this one. I feel like it's one of the least leveraged and it's the most efficient to create. It's so incredibly engaging because if you structure questions well, they literally educate so somebody is pulling insights that they can take action on. So I love that one. I think people forget too frequently about that one. Now, the next one, and you have definitely deployed this one many times for clients, is market research or market insight. Now, Daisy earlier had mentioned longer form content and things that people really want to read. And this is binge worthy because this might be intel on buyer behavior, what's happening in the market. Now, yes, this can be done with a third party marketing firm or market research firm, but it doesn't have to be because depending on your client base, there are oftentimes scenarios where you can harvest so many insights that you can actually capture that and put it into a piece of content that is extremely beneficial. And so you don't have to third party all of this data. So this oftentimes with tech or anything can be used in, um, you know, the uh, advisor environment. This is great for PR content and B2B, you know, and getting published and giving editors things that are worthy of uh, talking about your company and you know pointing to you as an expert. So I think there's just so many ways to chop this up and to just deliver really exciting information to the market that really positions you well. I'd say the next piece is probably educational content. And that's actually a follow on because a lot of that proprietary research and data that can be educational, but sometimes it is your traditional lunch and learns or a, an online course that you're offering. And it just, it needs to be the stuff that your clients and your prospects want to learn about, not the stuff that you want to teach them. Yeah. You can slide some of that in if you're providing high value content that they want to ingest, but you have to start with what are the questions that they're having trouble getting answered somewhere else? Or what are they trying to accomplish with their professional development that you can help them do? So some of the most successful educational content that I've worked with with my clients has been the types of online courses where people can earn continuing education credits. So if there's something that you can provide, and that's usually a partnership with some kind of learning platform, but they're always looking for content. Such they're always one. looking to accredit new courses. So if there's something you can put together that's high value to your prospects, whether it's directly related to you selling to them or not, that's a really great way to build out a strong funnel. Are you a CEO of a business to business company? Maybe you're a sales leader or a salesperson, or maybe you're in business to business marketing. Well, if so, I wrote a book for you and it's called Corporate Caffeine. Business to business marketing is different, but there are certain predictable fundamental principles that will help you unleash your organizational potential and fill your pipeline sustainably. So you can find my book on Audible, on Amazon, on barnesandnoble.com, or any of your favorite retailers. Hope you enjoy it, and I'd love to hear your feedback. 
All right, we're going to have to talk about a basic one, email as content. So uh, we don't love cold email. I want to go ahead and put that out there. And we've beat this to death because we have other you know, podcasts on this. But great subject lines, great content, great opening line. Give people what they want on email. This is not about selling. This is about serving. And the next one, obviously, is anything that makes the content fun. Because not everything has to be we're educating you about the thing. Here's your problem. Here's your solution. Just yes. do something that takes people off guard. It's like, ha ha, wasn't expecting it from that company, but well done. You know, it's the kind of thing that makes people glad that they're participating with your content. Exactly. My next one, I love assessments. I am a quiz junkie, so maybe that's just me, but there's so much great information. And when it's a really high value output, People will spend 5, 10, 15, even 20 minutes going through your assessment if you've built it right and talk about amazing lead quality um, because they know what they're getting into and then they know why they want to talk to you next. Oh, gosh, I love this one when it's connected to sales. And it's very worthwhile to create a wonderful experience of taking the assessment and receiving the results. Yeah, that's so huge. Just, don't blow it. Know, yeah, don't, don't give them like a <laughs> Word doc at the end of it create something that's wah. nicely branded and that has a clear next step associated yeah. with it yeah absolutely all right so thought leadership is <laughs> the next one and this is one of those things that everybody thinks that their content is thought leadership right even when it's just a blog uh, not not all blogs are thought leadership and one of the things that i say about thought leadership is if you're not saying something different than everyone else then it's not thought leadership. No. If everybody else is already there, you're not, you're not leading the way. You're not the pioneer. So think about the areas where you have a contrarian opinion, where you strongly disagree with the rest of your market or the rest of the uh, experts in your market about something or make a prediction about the future that you're, you're confident that will come to pass or give a different perspective on current trends. So when you're looking at thought leadership, think about how different you are. Oh, Absolutely. And I think a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to give an aha moment. Good if you do. But I love content that's like, huh, I've never thought about it that way before, which is exactly what you're talking about. So next one, one of my fav personal faves, speaking and webinars. So it can be on screen content or off screen. I mean, speaking is oftentimes live, of course. Um, but I find that this is a different flavor of content because you are engaging with a live or hopefully live audience. And so there is a different nuance to the emotion that you're evoking and taking them on a journey. Um, but these are huge and wildly beneficial assets as long as you're doing it in pur on purpose. And this is one that we love to deploy because it can be so close to the tip of the spear for lead generation if you've got really amazing content that's worthy of an audience. Another thing about speaking in webinars is that you have more of your funnel that's actually built around the event itself. So you've got your pre-event and your post-event emails and outreach and social media around it. But also one of the things that I like to incorporate is number one, making sure that the deck itself is a piece of content that can be shared afterward. That's one of the number one things that are, is requested. And yes. then that there's some kind of worksheet that people can use either during the presentation or that they can use as a takeaway after because those leave behinds does really help deliver value on an ongoing basis. So it's not just that flash in a pan. Oh, they sat and listened to me talk for an hour. Yeah. And now what? I mean, I find I will keep those workbooks and worksheets because now I have ownership because I engaged with that. So I completely agree when something stays on a bookshelf. Now that brings me to the next component. And this is not the easy one to create, but we work with a lot of clients that should be writing books and that have written books. We have one on a bestseller list right now, which That's is so true. exciting. Yes. We just launched that. Mike Myro shot out, but <laughs> <laughs> but I do love books. And especially when it goes back to that thought leadership and contrarian opinion, where you really have something substantial to stand upon that can add value. There is nothing as believable as somebody that went the distance to really put high value content in a book. And then you can do interesting things with this. I mean, not only can you put it in different versions, but you can download chapters, you can do snippets. I feel find it makes so many other things easier when you have such a robust piece of content to be able to extract and then point back to. And of course, it's a fantastic leave behind you've just got to think appropriately about what's the goal yes. of that book and you're not allowed to use ai to write that for you. no 
please don't. Please <laughs> no, don't. the world does not need more of that. Exactly. Uh, the next thing that I'd like to touch on really quickly is building courses. So this is another kind of educational content, but it's designed to be over a longer period of time. So unlike I'm going to go and do this online educational piece, then it's, you know, 50 minutes and then it's done creating that ongoing, okay, this week we're working on this, this week we're working on that. And the th thing that I would encourage people to do is don't start with something that's overly complicated. Figure out over the next four weeks, what are the things that I could teach my customers how to do or how to problem solve around? And how do I create it just a little mini course? It's really easy for them to commit to. And it's easy to, for them to feel successful at because it's just a few simple steps, but it's done at a cadence that helps them follow through with it instead of feeling overwhelmed. I think we've had a really great list. And the one thing I want to add to this is video. Not surprising. You're watching a video right now. Video is wildly effective and you should be thinking in regards to all of the aspects that we just brought forward. Should this be on video instead of written content? Um, we know that it tracks way more traffic. Um, it's said that is what 53 times more likely to get ranked on the first page of Google or the top list of Google if your website has video on it. And I know you've collected some additional amazing statistics. I do. I'd like, to, like to just share a few of those before we wrap up. So according to Marketing Sherpa, videos attract three times the traffic three times. of other types of content and they help nurture leads including a video on your landing page can boost your conversion rate by up to 80%. We see that all the time. Yes, video on every landing page. 65% of executives have gone to the marketer's site and 39% have called them on the phone after watching marketing videos. We add a lot of videos to our sales enablement as follow-up. Yes. And sometimes it's even when a prospect is not a great fit or I'm not sure if we're the right fit for them, I will send them a video to go, please watch this before our next call because I think it's gonna clarify the problems that you have and help you figure out your next. And so I love being able to do that high quality support. Yes, email with video in it. I love that. And then the final statistics I wanted to share was on average people spend 2.6 times more time on pages with video than without. So it's all the things. It's getting ranked, people clicking, people watching, people staying people reaching out. It's every single step in your content funnel is better with video in it. Exactly. So as a final wrap up, yes, you should be doing B2B content, but not content for content's sake. You should be thinking about how does this apply to the buyer's journey? What is the role and goal? And what is the best type of approach and the best style of content to really engage the brain and convert interest into inquiry and to support the buyer's progress as well as your sales progress. You guys, thank you so much. Go ahead and hit that like button. I mean, come on. You just sat through the whole video. And even better, hit subscribe because that means we will get to see you next week on Word Network.